everyone. Welcome to Tea Time History Chat Live. Philip Lacey Brawl here from British History Tours, British History Events. And welcome to our weekly chat. I am live, uh, live streaming from uh, my office over to Instagram and YouTube at the same time. So you can find me if you're on YouTube. I'm also on Instagram at British underscore history underscore tours. And if you're on Instagram, I'm also on YouTube at British History. So this week for our little chat, I hope you're um, settled in nicely. I can see people joining. Um, Dorothy, welcome from Poland. Marianne in California, hi. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, give me a wave. Let me know where you're joining from. Let me know you can hear me okay, because as usual, I have my lovely little mic set up um, going on here. Um, I've got some thank yous to start off with, but before I do that, let me just give you a little bit of an overview as to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so I've been doing some reading about Thomas Tresham um, and uh, good morning, Robin in uh, Virginia. Uh, I've been doing a bit of reading about um, uh, Thomas Tresham. So I want to give you a little bit of an insight into that and tell you why I've been doing that. Um, it's, of course, on this day in 1558 that Elizabeth I becomes queen, Mary I, her half-sister, dies. So we'll have a little bit of a chat about that. Um, and I will let you know what um, what I've been up to because from <laughs> Anna's in uh, <laughs> YouTubing, having lunch and listening to me, well, thank you very much. And Doug, you should be working. Um, it's... Uh, Hello from India. Oh, we've got people joining from all uh, Brie in Palm Springs. Um, Fancy Bakes. Oh, you're a bit too far away to send me a cake in New Zealand. Um, Isith in Panama. Oh, sorry, Isabel. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Um, uh, McFernberg in Boston. Jamie in New York. Cool Cat in Long Island. Caroline in North Carolina. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Amy is 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 um double tasking watching this and writing her christmas list well good well done i suppose we're actually not that long away are we i saw um a post earlier about how many days oh it's until elf on the shelf i don't know if any of you do elf on the shelf <laughs> any of you got small kids or even if you haven't got small kids where the elves come on the first of december and keep an eye on everyone until it's time to go back and report back to santa and tell him whether you've been good or not and whether you deserve presents but they get up to all sorts of mischief while they're while they're in your house and i saw a um post saying it's i'm sure they've got it wrong because what how many days is it till the end till the first of december anyway it's looming people we have to get your ideas together so you don't get that <gasps> every morning where you've got to work out how they're going to have caused chaos overnight before the children come down um Anna's to help on the shelf as well once you get started you see you can't stop you can't come back from it you can't say all oh, the elves just haven't turned up this year how are you going to explain that one so yeah Jenna has them there too <laughs> so we get into the moment to Christmas um as we come up to Christmas so um I'll let you know. We're, I'm going to be taking a break over Christmas, um, but we're going to have some fun things um, happening on History After Dark, on Visiting Tudor Britain and on here as we run up to um, uh, to Christmas. So, um, and the break. Um, <laughs> Mayfair Forest, which is now multitasking, <laughs> sewing on a button. Excellent. Well, there you go. That you've got an hour to do that yet yeah. <laughs> um, before she has to go. So, uh, um, sorry. Let me just see. I've had a few more comments. Brie, elf, <laughs> elf on the shelf for a nephew and niece. Um, uh, Shania Samel, uh, absolutely eager to know British history. Britain is connected to our past, of course, and I feel we need to know more about the rich history too. History is um, just. It's a great way, I think, of getting an insight into ourselves now as well, as well as being full of stories you couldn't make up, stories that seem too amazing and people, interesting people just that we can delve into. So like I said, today is the anniversary of Elizabeth I coming to the throne. Um, so, of course, her sister Mary dying. So we will talk a little bit about that. About that. I've said I'm going to speak a little bit about Thomas Tresham, why I've been um, 
reading up about him, for what purpose. I'll let you know about uh, a couple of interviews that have gone live that I think you'll be interested in in watching. Um, and we, what else did I want to talk to you about? Oh, well, I've, I've got to mention the Stuart Summit. Sorry if, you know, lots of you I know have already got your tickets, but we are just over 24 hours away from it starting. It starts at eight o'clock tomorrow night and you have to have bought your ticket by then otherwise you can't get one but all of the talks at the Stuart Summit will be available until the 31st of January so you don't even have to make it this weekend um but uh, but you do need to have got your ticket so um oh I can also give you a little bit of an insight I haven't got it with me but the book that the, Gareth Russell's latest book I'm reading that at the moment um about the Queen Mother and he will be on with us all being well on History After Dark on Wednesday. And if you don't know what History After Dark is, um, we basically hang loose. <laughs> we don't worry about being too um, PC on History After Dark. And we do that show at quarter past eight in an evening every Wednesday on YouTube now, as well as Instagram. And it's history.after.dark on uh on Instagram and History After Dark on YouTube. So um, next week, like I say, we should be joined by Gareth Russell. Hiya, Brian, down there in a wet, cold Cornwall. Yes, I think the whole of us, the whole of the island is suffering, isn't it, with all this rain. Um, uh, Massimo Max, so if you sign up to the Stuart Summit, then you get emails from Eventbrite. Look out for event. Uh, Eventbrite emails make sure they're not going to your spam and there is basically a button that says join the event and you'll get a reminder two hours before you'll get a reminder as it goes and you should or this is the first time I've used Eventbrite get an email every time there's a new uh every time a talk goes live as well um if if that doesn't happen for the first one I will be manually sending out emails to them so so don't fear uh that will just it will all come through to you um how much uh, how much is manual will is left to be seen um my fair forest which yes if you don't know what history after dark is philip are taking a long pause then to try and work out how to explain it it's fun it's really fun uh brie there's a schedule for the summit on the event page now i've updated that so if you go to um bear with me a moment and i will tell you um, if you go to Stuart Summit 2022.eventbrite.co.uk or if you've got a ticket via the link that you would have been sent um, from Eventbrite, then I've updated that event page and it's got all the timings on it. So, um, oh good, Jenna says the emails have been coming through. So if you have got a ticket for the Stuart Summit and you haven't been getting your getting your emails, please check your spam um, folder for Eventbrite emails. Right, I need to sip my water because my voice is already going before we get into, um, into today. Also, I went to Harvington Hall at night time. I think last week I spoke about Harvington Hall, um, but I was going back the following day. So I will give you a little bit, um, I will talk a bit about that. I did include that in in the uh, my weekly newsletter that went out on Sunday. If you have not signed up to my newsletter, it's a Substack newsletter, and um, and it's free, and you get a um, you get a summary of what I've been up to in the week uh, every Sunday, and also when new podcast goes live, I've, I've hosted it on there, so you get a you get a notification to say when. Um, thank you, Jenna, putting the link to the summit in the comments. But yes, if you're on my Substack, then you uh, get links to any new podcasts and YouTube videos that go live. So it's it's basically easier if you're lazy like me and you're not going to go looking for stuff, but you want it. It comes to you. It's easy peasy. Uh, I have some thank yous. One, uh, I want to thank everyone who's bought me a badge on Instagram. Thank you so much. As as many of you have been watching me for a few weeks will know, um, I would like to get myself a new lapel mic. Currently, my old one is attached to this one with a hairband um, <laughs> after it's broken. So that is my uh, my next uh, purchase. No problem. Thank you. You're very um, welcome. And I hope to see you again. So saying goodbye to somebody. 
um yeah so thank you for all the badges on instagram if you want to buy me one please feel free i would be very grateful and on uh youtube you can um you can buy me a super chat or how about joining my patreon now this is the reason i've been reading about thomas tresham today is because that is the next blog that i will be doing in patreon so if you're one of my patrons it's five pounds a month and you can cancel any time if you wish um but there's a monthly blog which is exclusive to patreon um and you get oh yes this is the thing i must mention you get to ask historians your own questions i'm collecting in questions at the moment um in fact until tomorrow for dr joanne paul she wrote the book um recently the house of dudley which I've spoken about, which uh, charts the the rise of the Dudleys and the fall of the Dudleys, uh, and then another rise and another fall and another rise and then the end, <laughs> pretty much. So uh, it's it it it's an incredibly interesting book. But I will be interviewing Joanne Paul um, in a few weeks' time. So I'm collecting in questions for her. If you want to ask her a question, pop along to my Patreon, Patreon, and you can. Um, and you can join and ask her a question as well as access all of the exclusive content from the last 12 months and obviously everything going forward. So I, but I, I I'll tell you a little bit more about what the next blog is going to be on um, and about Thomas Tresham shortly. Um, we have three new patrons I need to say hello and thank you to Candice, Brianna, Brie, I've seen you already on here, and Charlotte um, are all new patrons this week. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you enjoy the content and uh, give yourself, I don't know, get more cups of tea ready and just go back through the through the catalogue. Um, where should we start? Should we start with Tresham? No, let's start with Elizabeth. So I'm only going to do this quickly. Um, but if you, um, uh, Sorry, I'm just uh, messing around with my new tech on, <laughs> with my new tech on uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Um, yeah, this, so 1558, we have Mary I dying at St. James's Palace in um, Whitehall, really. So St. James's Palace was, it, it's still used, you would have seen it. St. James's Palace, um, if you watch the Accession Council, uh, when our Queen died earlier this year and Charles III um, it was proclaimed, that happened initially at St James's Palace. That's the first place for him to be proclaimed. It was where the Accession Council took place. And it was at St James's Palace that Mary, who now is Mary I because we had a Mary II, her, at Morning Colleen, um, who, where she, uh, where she died. Um it was actually, as a, a bit of an aside, St. James's Palace was built as a nursery for Henry VIII's children that he was going to have with Anne Boleyn. But it wasn't finished in time for the birth of Elizabeth. Um, and of course, she was born at Greenwich. Bit of an aside. So St. James's Palace, Mary, the, Mary dies there. Um, she's, um, she's, she's struggled with gynecological issues she thinks she's pregnant on at least two occasions when she, when she's not um and uh i saw her wooden effigy uh at westminster abbey which any of you who go it's up in the jubilee galleries along with other uh, other effigies and what they used to do is is carve the the effigy that went into the funeral procession uh, out of wood and it would go on top of the coffin. Mary's Mary's effigy at Westminster Abbey, this this wooden one that went onto her coffin, literally made me stop in my tracks. Now we've heard that you know she has these false pregnancies. We've heard that she has a swelling of the belly, um, and she thinks she's pregnant, and then she's not, and this, then the swelling subsides, and but she's still got swelling and problems and her periods stop and so all these indications sort of oh, she must um uh be pregnant now when she dies and it's been postulated that she dies of um ovarian or womb cancer she has what looks like a pregnant belly and this is really 
clear from the wooden effigy that's at Westminster Abbey, the one that that, that sat on top of her coffin in the in the funeral procession. Um, good morning, Karen, over there, in New Jersey. Uh, so that really shocked me, actually. I don't know why. Um, I don't suppose I thought maybe the effigies would be so true to life, but it, it definitely shows a um, a belly that. I wouldn't even call it a belly, you know, it was just, it's just, she, she, her, her middle is rounded exactly like it would be if you were four or five months pregnant. Um, so she was clearly suffering and she dies in the early hours of 17th of November, 1558. Um, and her sister, Elizabeth, is her heir and, and she's, happy for that she did of course want elizabeth to continue with the counter reformation um and return england to catholicism <clears throat> and uh, i'll probably come back to that in a bit when i'm talking about thomas tresham um the the ring i don't actually know what the, the there's a ring on and on uh, mary's finger that's taken off and rid and it's taken um to hatfield house which is where elizabeth was actually being kept um, as prisoner, but house arrest in, in lots of comfort. Um, she's reading in the garden, we're told, or the, the grounds of Hatfield House when, um, when she's approached and told that she is queen. And I've put a post on Instagram today with the quote um, that she's supposed to have uh, said when she was told and it basically it's in latin but translates uh, to um uh, this is god's doing uh, it is marvelous in our eyes and uh david starkey if you read his book he says she's very clever from the outset she is clever she's she is um well I say outset i mean she's already she'd already shown she's um that she was clever and she thought things through before this, but she is quoting from um, uh, the Bible. I think she's quoting in the New Testament, but she's saying it in Latin. So she's sort of, sort of placating each side, whether you're Catholic or Protestant. So she's, she's not sticking her marker um, in the sand at this, at this early stage. Um, so Elizabeth, um, She's at Hatfield House, and you can still go to um, the 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 great what was the Great Hall, um, where she held her first council, um, and you can still go there. It's actually if you go to Hatfield House, it's actually not part of the main house. You can get into there without going into the main house if they've not got a function on, which they do have quite a lot. Uh, but you can still go there. You can also, so she's supposed to have been in the grounds of Hatfield House, sitting underneath an oak tree, reading a book. This is the middle of November. I'm imagining it's not raining as much as it's been raining so far <laughs> this week uh, in, in, in November here now. But although she wouldn't be sitting on the floor, I can tell you. She, um, no, then that oak died um, and our... Queen Elizabeth II planted one in its place. So you can go to the to the supposedly the point, the the the, the place where Elizabeth was when she found out she'd become queen. And there's that lovely link then to Queen Elizabeth II as well. Um, so it's a much, much younger oak tree um, than you would expect. In fact, I'll I'll share um some photos of it on Instagram later. Excuse me. Um and like I say, and then Elizabeth um, has her accession council. Now we're um, in two weeks' time at history after, in History After Dark. So not next Wednesday. The Wednesday after, we're going to be discussing how Anne Boleyn's memory sort of and the way Anne Boleyn is talked about changes once Elizabeth becomes queen. So we'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in, in that, you want to come along, History After Dark, 8.15, on a Wednesday night, um, leave your sensibilities somewhere else <laughs> for the hour. Uh, just come along and have fun. And you can watch us either on Instagram, history.after.doc or YouTube, history after doc. Um, 
and we'll be discussing we'll be discussing Anne Boleyn's memory once Elizabeth becomes queen. So it's um, it's a time of uh, turmoil, I suppose, for um, for people who who, I, who whose religion is 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 front and center of their lives. More likely, obviously, the everyday person that is. Although I, I do struggle to think that it's the only thing they were concerned about when you have to find food and shelter on a uh, alarmingly regular basis uh, with difficulty. Um, but there was there were certain families who um, who really suffered during the Protestant Reformation and were hoping for. Um, a easier time under Elizabeth and I think from 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 the accounts I've read um I think Elizabeth set out to be quite even-handed but events were going to um were going to get ahead of her with that and she was going to really be left with possibly very little choice now what I should say though I think is worth noting is we um Mary the first obviously has this sobriquet of being the bloody uh, of being bloody Mary burning over 300 Protestants at the stake now at least 200 people were killed um ostensibly due to their beliefs but deemed traitors um under the reign of Elizabeth not only that according to Jessie Childs she has the um the dubious uh record uh, of being the uh or dubious number one spot anyway for having the most number of people uh tortured during her reign so the, the, they have the warrants um for people getting tortured some not all of them have her signature but some of them do and um, so i think the uh the comparison uh of mary is bloody mary therefore elizabeth is some sort of um, virtuous, all inclusive, um, tolerant queen is um, rather a uh, result of propaganda and perhaps selective memory than, uh, than 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 many would admit. On YouTube, I have an interview with Tracy Borman, uh, which actually went live a year ago, but still completely relevant. Which you can watch after this. Um, I will share it to. Uh, Instagram so you can follow the link through um, and if you're on YouTube you can go looking for it anyway so that's on my channel now Jenna says I think Elizabeth was stuck between a rock and a hard place with that situation I could be wrong so correct me if I don't uh, if I am I don't think Elizabeth cared what religion you were I don't see so so this is really interesting um you know was it her advisors forcing her on that so I mentioned earlier that I'm going to be writing a blog for my patrons on Thomas Tresham, and this all comes into this. Thomas Tresham um, was um, a uh, a Catholic recusant Englishman, um, and I and I mention that because his family is, you know, generation after generation um, of loyal, you know, subjects. He's born in 1543. Um, he doesn't die till 1605 um and he is a he's a, he's a catholic recusant now he was known to elizabeth and um actually knighted by elizabeth in in 1575 at kenilworth during her um progress but he was um dedicated to his faith and being able to practice his faith um now in 1570 so roll back a little bit the Pope excommunicates Elizabeth. What that effectively does is, is say every Catholic in England can and should aim to overthrow Elizabeth, kill her if you must, and replace her probably with someone like Mary Queen of Scots. So a Catholic... Um, uh, re replacement 
that sets off a series of events you then have people you then have you have your uh, babington plot coming up you have i mean you've got the spanish armada you've got i mean these are not in the right order but um but i'll go into them in uh, in in the blog that i'm going to write so you have um uh this 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 move by the pope what you also have is a conflation of uh religion with loyalty to the crown that one goes hand in hand with the other if you're catholic you're effectively a bad englishman you're you're you're, you're you you could very well be a traitor um if you're protestant you're a loyal state but you you know you're loyal to the monarch and you are a worthy subject and you get that that link made that then cannot be unlinked and yet really one has very little to do with the other except you have of course not I say that but then you have the pope um effectively issuing a a death warrant on the on, on elizabeth's head um for catholics to enact should they wish to um so but, but I think that came came on the back of mass being <laughs> uh, banned. So it, it, this 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 should be a warning to everyone, you know, living now. When the state get involved in your individual beliefs and thoughts, it's not a good idea. And this is a it's a perfect way of seeing it from afar. And what really struck me struck home to me about the, uh, this was that individual just can I not just worship my God as I want to and it was at Harvington Hall last Friday the whole so let me tell you about that so Harvington Hall recusant's house in um in Elizabethan England so you have um you have a Catholic family living there clearly hearing mass harboring uh, priests um uh, you need a priest to hear mass and um and they played out this scenario so this is all by candlelight it's very very atmospheric and and the fires were on it was lovely um except the so then but then so your guests of the uh the packington family that night when we were there and you you see this scenario play out whereby the um the house is raided they're looking for priests priests by um by by the i can't remember the year but by 15 by the mid 1570 uh mid 1570s being a, a priest if you were a priest catholic priest and you set foot on english soil that is it's illegal for you to do that you shouldn't you can't be here you will be arrested you will be killed if you harbor a priest there are severe penalties as well. So um, lots of effort goes toward finding priests in, of course, uh, the um, uh, the houses of Catholic families, known Catholic families. And uh, and this scenario played out at Harvington Hall and Phil, who's the um, uh, who's the uh, house manager was also a very good actor, I have to say. Uh, and he played a young um, Jesuit priest. These these were priests that were, um, oh, Colleen, thank you for the badge. Thank you very much for your support. Really welcome. Um, appreciate it. Um, yeah, he, so he plays this Jesuit priest. Jesuit priests um, were really... Um, they were sent with a mission from the Pope to convert. Um, so not just to provide the mass for already practicing Catholics, but actually actively convert people who weren't um, back to the true faith. So, so, so Phil plays um, one of these priests who hides in, in the priest hide. Um, he gets found. Um, but at one part, he's just lamenting, why can we not just be left to worship how we want to worship? And that really hit me um, because, yeah, this is, this is, 
This conflation of your religion and therefore your loyalty to the crown um, didn't need to be made. Maybe it did need to be made in terms of um, uh, politically, you know, politically needed to be made. However, there's nothing that actually connects those two things until you make it so. But you've got, um, of course, you had in... Um, what year was it? Was it 1573? I'm trying to think. Someone someone can find out for me. The uh, St. Bartholomew Day Massacre in Paris. Now, Sir Francis Walsingham, who was Elizabeth's spymaster, was there on that day. I'm pretty sure there's somebody else there as well, but I can't think who it was. It was one of the... Maybe it was just him. But um, So this becomes personal to Walsingham and he manages to back to Jenna's point about um Elizabeth potentially wanted to be more tolerant but she gets pushed down this path both by events and more actively by her advisors to uh that the Catholics are literally a threat to her and then there are plots to overthrow Elizabeth and kill her and replace her so um so you you have this um <laughs> these these I don't want to say series it makes it sound like it's all this linear but you have all these things happening that whichever side of the argument you want to stand on you will find justification for excuse me a moment um so so by the end of Elizabeth's reign you have intolerance to Catholicism um, being practiced um you have people like Thomas Tresham um, who spent 12 years of his life incarcerated um, in debt because he's also paid something in the region of £8,000 in fines for not attending Anglican services on a Sunday. So it started off, the fines for not attending an Anglican service had started off quite low. Um, and then they, they'd actually increased hundredfold by um by the time you sort of got the uh, uh well I was gonna say by the end of Elizabeth's reign but I think I think much earlier on from that um then of course you have um the time of James so 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 the Catholic recusants people like Thomas Tresham who like I say I'll be writing a blog about um for uh, my patrons um later on this month um when Elizabeth dies they're thinking James the first James James VI of Scotland is going to become our king his mother was Mary Queen of Scots his mother died at the hands of Elizabeth um it ostensibly in in this sort of um Catholic versus Protestant argument um he's going to be more tolerant towards Catholics we're going to be able to just get on with how we want to worship again. Of course, when James does become king, that is not the case at all. Um, and by 1605, you've got another plot, uh, this time the gunpowder plot. Uh, Thomas Tresham's son, Francis Tresham, is part of that group. Um, and so you have another plot to kill the king. So, of course, you, that then that then um exacerbates the issue and um yeah what what can you what can what can the king do other than come down very hard on on catholics um so it's uh, oh it's sort of one of these like the, the this this chain reaction of all these events that just gets worse and worse and worse and worse um now james the first is the uh topic of a talk by tracy borman at this weekend's Stuart Summit, she's going to be talking about James. So that, that actually comes into it, his attitudes towards Catholicism. But she's talking specifically about his attitudes to uh, witchcraft. Um, and that's the real life inspiration. She wrote a book actually called James I and the English Witch Hunts, which is the title of her talk. And it's the inspiration behind her um, fictional witches trilogy. Um, so that so anyone who's got a ticket for the Stuart Summit this weekend, you you'll be hearing that talk. So you'll, you'll this all sort of starts to knit together. 
Um, so Thomas Tresham, the reason I've sort of got this idea as well for writing the blog about him is I was on Natalie Gruniger's Patreon podcast uh on saturday night saturday night my time it was sunday morning her time we were both a bit bleary eyed um but because for me because it was the end of the day and for her it's because she just got up but it was it was really fun um and we talked about a lot about uh mainly about where to um visit tudor yeah tudor places in in uh, in england um and one of the hidden gems that I I picked out for people to to try and see if they can is a place that Thomas Tresham this um Catholic recusant I've been talking about um built and it was ostensibly built as a a, a rabbit warrener's lodge I don't think anyone anyone would have been fooled now interestingly um um the um the, the 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 lodge was built after one of his in, long incarcerations jenna a good lesson for us all across the pond with thanksgiving being a week from today oh yes that, gosh that's really soon isn't it all of these events had a part to play indeed um you can see though can't you how you know this is this this these if we just take the reformation counter reformation counter counter reformation whatever it's called um this happens over multiple lifetimes no one gets to see all of this through and so we can look back and we can see how events led to other events to other events and you can kind of see this snowball effect of 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 things getting out of control to a point where people are, are burnt just for how they would like to worship the same god the same God <laughs> and they're, and they're burning each other over it. Um, and for us, anyway, I'll go, I'll go off on a tangent a little bit. If I start talking about why I think we should take notice, this is not something that's just consigned to the past. This can happen and does happen and has happened since. Um, so, but, it, but, it, but it's, it's absolutely fascinating, but yeah, I think it's worth, worth remembering that we can see it all but nobody in it could see it all. They, this happens over multiple uh, lifetimes. So um, now let me tell you a little bit more about Thomas Tresham's uh, Rushton Triangular Lodge. And if you are a patron, you'll see pictures of this in the blog um, that I'm going to write for you about it, about Thomas Tresham and his, his basic building. Um, I, I'm calling it Thomas Tresham Devotion in Brick. Well, at least that's the working title. So I might change it, but that's, that's what I'm calling it at the moment. He gets out of um, uh, his incarceration and he builds this um, rabbit warreners lodge. It's clearly not a rabbit warreners lodge. If you saw it today, you go, right, what is that? That is something else. That is not what it's claiming to be. And that's just with our, yeah, that's just just us looking at it without um, the kind of knowledge that just every person would have had about messages um, in in uh, numbers, in scripture, in uh, visual uh, architecture, pictures, whatever. Um, cryptography, I think people call it. So it is a basically a devotion to the Holy Trinity everything is around the number three it's a three-sided equilateral triangle it has three floors there are three gables on each facade there are there is a uh, biblical inscription on each facade 33 letters long each one um that, that's just the beginning everywhere uh, the, the windows are um You've either got triangles or you have, um, I think there's circles in, in in parts of it. But if I just give you an idea, like I say, if you're a patron, I'll share. I've got loads of photographs from when I visited, um, which I will share in the blog and also um, separately as well. So you can have a really good look. Because um, actually, even in the guidebook, it's not, they're not particularly, eh, it's not particularly good. I don't know if you're going to get an idea um whoop, if I hold it up to 
No, it's not going to do it. I needed to focus. Focus on Instagram. It's not going to do it, is it? Google it. <laughs> Google it. I'll do it for uh, so on YouTube. It's um so uh Eminem BA. We're talking at the moment about a guy called Thomas Tresham, who's a Catholic recusant, because it's today. Well, he's relevant because I'm writing a blog about him. That's why I'm talking about him. But also today, you've got the ascension of Elizabeth I to the throne um, and the um, uh, the death of her Catholic half-sister, Mary I. And so we're talking about the religious turmoils that, that, that have happened up to then and are happening since. And Thomas Tresham is a really great example of how this develops. So he's incarcerated for his beliefs. He's actually incarcerated because he um, harbors a priest, I think. Um, he's paid, like I say, over, I think his, his income is over £2,000 a year, um, but he ends up paying around about £8,000 in fines over a, a period. I, I don't know how long. Um, but but when he comes out of uh, one incarceration, uh, 1575, I think, um, 15, no, it won't be 1575, that's when he's knighted. Um, but he comes out and he builds Rushton Triangular Lodge. Um, and like I say, it's just a complete devotion to the Holy Trinity. Um, everywhere. So like I say, I'll share some photographs with my patrons. Um so that you can see, but I mean, you can Google them. You can also Google it. Um, it's run by English, which looked after by English heritage now. So you also have, um, uh, you also, uh, are able to, to see their website about it. Hi, Sandy in Oklahoma. Hi, Marie. How are you doing? Hi, Peter. Marie, <laughs> Mayfair Forest, which, uh, it's not history after dark. If Philip says Google it, you can Google it. Yes. If, if, <laughs> yes. If you ever join us on History After Dark, which if any of you like your history unbridled, you will thoroughly enjoy. Uh, we do have to, dis in fact, we forgot it in the disclaimer yesterday, but we, in our normal disclaimer is um, if we mention it, don't Google it. <laughs> or if you do, you Google it at your own um, risk. Mm. So, <laughs> so yeah, so you can Google pictures of Rushton Triangular Lodge. Um, uh, so where was I with that? Um, anyway, you can go in. It, 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 Jesse Childs has written a great, um, article about it for, uh, the history, for History Extra magazine. And, um, in that she, um, postulates that it actually, it, it, it was never even lived in as a, as a, it was clearly not built to be a Warrener's Lodge, although you, it's got, it's got three, um, floors it's actually got this little cellar um and um uh sorry i've just seen your 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 question sandy i'll come back to that in a moment um and jesse uh, child's postulates that perhaps this was a sort of a, a quiet space for devotion private devotion um for thomas perhaps so, um, hello uh, from El Salvador and Jared as well. Um, Peru, El Mc, uh, Mc Salvador, welcome. Now, Sandy, let me, um, oh, Colleen, I have a friend that loves the number three. You have definitely found something of interest for her. So uh, I'll, oh, I'll come back to that in a second. Remind me, I'm going to tell you a little bit more. Um, hi, Marie. Thank you. Sandy, please explain Thomas's relevance to King James I. I must have missed it. Okay, so Thomas Tresham. What you might want to do, Sandy, if you're not already, is join my Patreon because I will be doing a full blog on Thomas. Uh, but basically, Thomas lives um, till 1603. Uh, no, 1605, I think. 1605. Um, and so he's he's outlived Elizabeth only by um, two years. He's a he's a Catholic recusant. Now he's part of the group that are hoping that as soon as um, James comes to the throne, because he is a son, the son of a uh, of Mary Queen of Scots who who died ostensibly a, a Catholic martyr, um, that that he's going to be more tolerant towards the Catholic faith, and they're going to be able to get back to um, to being able to worship as you know as they wish. 
Yeah. Um, however, James is not tolerant at all. Uh, only exacerbated, of course, by the gunpowder plot, which Thomas Tresham's son, Francis, was involved in. And mm, it's possible that uh, that Francis was the, um, the, the author of the Montego letter, which is sent to his brother-in-law. He has two brother-in-laws that would have been sat in Parliament had the, at the time that the bomb, that the gunpowder would have exploded. Um, and so that's used as sort of an indication or evidence that he would have written the letter although it there, there is there's no we don't know we don't know who wrote the letter to warn Mount Eagle who then warned Cecil um who then had the House of Parliament uh sellers searched came across Guy Fawkes plan was foiled if that gunpowder had exploded we would not have um we'd have a massive crater where the Houses of Parliament are, we probably wouldn't have Westminster Abbey, I don't think, and the course of the Thames would have um, would have changed somewhat, um, which is rather fascinating to think of. So, um, so that's that's the relevance of James I to Thomas Tresham. Of course, his name Tresham. So you've got T R E S Tre at the beginning um, is also the number three. So there's and, and Tudors loved um, these um, uh, sort of the plays on their names. Um, Sandy James the first was raised by Elizabeth after his mother became prisoner. No, James the first remained up in Scotland. Um, uh, so he wasn't. No, he wasn't raised by Elizabeth. Um, I don't actually think they ever met. Um, Elizabeth certainly didn't meet Mary Queen of Scots. Um, I don't think she ever met James. I mean, we could get into a whole discussion about um, Elizabeth and her heirs, but uh, that's that's for another day. Um, so you've got Tracy Borman's interview with me to check out. There's a there's a ten minute version and then there's a full version. So depending on how much time you've got. Um, uh, over on YouTube and I will share some uh, I will share the link to that um, if you've got questions about Dudley's so got Edmund Dudley John Dudley so Edmund Dudley was um, Henry VII's right hand man sort of John Dudley who brings um, Lady Jane Grey to the throne unsuccessfully uh, and Robert Dudley who was obviously um, Elizabeth I's favourite. Um, so uh, that entire story is fascinating and I will be interviewing Joanne Paul in a couple of weeks. So you can put your own questions to Joanne if you're a patron. If you're not, head over to patreon.com forward slash British history and you can join and ask your questions. Um, you can do that every, every, basically every time I interview a historian, you can put your own questions to them. Um, if you are a patron, it's a perk of being a patron. Um, uh, which I think is pretty cool. I also though, yesterday I've got a bit of a bonus um interview uh this was oh, this is going to be really fun so the it, it linked to robert dudley the lord leicester hospital i spoke to yesterday to the master there um done an interview with her and i am going over to the lord leicester hospital it's currently um oh thank you for the badge sandy thank you very much um, much appreciated uh yeah, so I'm going over to the Lord Best Hospital. It's closed to the public at the moment. So again, if you're a patron, you're going to see lots of um, photographs from behind the scenes that literally no one else is going to be able to get. Um, and uh, But I will be putting it together um, as well alongside the interview with um, uh, Heidi Mayer, who is the master at Lord Leicester Hospital explaining all about the building, um, what it was used for. Actually, if you follow them on Instagram, you'll have seen that there is a big seal, what they call a seal, seven foot in diameter, this seal. It's up on the wall, high. It's been it's been behind a false ceiling um, for a while, and it commemorates the visit of James I to the Lord Leicester Hospital. Um, I can't remember what year. I think it was 1617, but I could have that wrong. Um, 
And he didn't stay there. He would usually have stayed at Kenilworth Castle, of course, which isn't too far away. But there'd been a fire, so he stays at Lord Leicester Hospital. And it's hospital uh, with the with the root of that word in hospitality as opposed to a medical institution. Um, Marie, I think I recall correctly that um, Elizabeth had more suitors after her throne than for for uh, sorry had <laughs> hang on Elizabeth had more suitors after her throne than for her hand in marriage in the end. Mm. Uh, Jenna, my daughter learned about the gunpowder plot recently during a new episode of The Crown. She was shocked a bit and said she wouldn't have we wouldn't have Big Ben if that happened. We wouldn't. No, no, because if you think, oh, thank you, Liz, for the badge. Thank you so much. If you think about it, um, this wouldn't have been something that was just rebuilt. So let's take examples of other um, places that never recover. Um, so Elton Palace is an example. Um, incredibly important, um, significant palace and it 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 slowly declines over time, but then we get the civil war. By the time we have Charles II, it's not an important site to him. It's too long down the down the years for it to be restored and used again. And I think with uh, the so it would have been the Palace of Westminster. <clears throat> um, it would have been so devastating the explosion. Um, that would have happened on the 5th of November. It would have been so devastating that the seat of power would have to have been moved somewhere else. And by the time anything could have been re-established at Whitehall, if if that was something that people wanted to do, um, it would have been too far down the line. You'd already have had a seat of power established somewhere else. Um, there's a whole interesting story about why, why we have our seat of power at Westminster and Whitehall anyway, which um, I've done various videos on in the past. Uh, I find it fascinating. Um, you know, it's all, all links back right back to the, the move from Winchester to, to Westminster. Um, uh, now, talking of Winchester, <laughs> that was the topic of uh, Friday's Visiting Tudor Britain, which you can find on my Instagram. I hosted it last week um, and we talked all about Winchester, Tudor Winchester. Didn't even go into, uh, I, did, I, I couldn't help but mention a little bit about Rome and Winchester um, and Anglo-Saxon Winchester. Uh, but but we were talking about Tudor Winchester. Um, oh, there's Jane Austen. There's there's so much stuff in Winchester. It's, it's brilliant. I was there last Christmas um, for my second or third visit there. Um, so if you want to check that out, you can go back to my Instagram, click on the, um, the videos tab or reels tab. I can't remember what they call it now. Um, and, it, and it's there just a few, a few back. I think actually it's on my grid as well, my main profile. So you can get to it from there. Um, and we've spoken about history after dark a couple of times last night, we were talking about, um, Arthur Tudor and Catherine of Aragon, did they, or didn't they? So you can check that out if you didn't already. Again, you can find that on YouTube. We were very brave yesterday and we actually we actually streamed live on YouTube. Up until last night, we had um, we had done it as a private stream and then made it public afterwards. We just went for it last night. Pfft, so brave. Um, Maria, welcome from Iowa. Thank you for joining us. Um, let me just take a sip of my water. My voice is going. Hmm. So... Uh, tomorrow on visiting Tudor Britain, uh, <laughs> Brie had was hilarious. Had is yeah, you just got to you've got to come along if you haven't already. Give it a go. You might surprise yourself. <laughs> I don't think I think most people when they watch it do enjoy it and come back. I don't think we've offended anyone to the point of them not coming back yet. If we have, then oh well. It's kind of kind of been part of the course. I think we've offended Instagram more than we've offended any individuals. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so tomorrow on visiting Tudor Britain, uh, we are talking Worcester, and I am hosting it. So uh, again, it will be on my Instagram. Um, don't forget more on T T T and three for my Daphne. <laughs> more on TT. 
Three for Daphne. She's going to love Rushton Triangle Lodge. I'll also be talking in my blog about... Um, about uh, I'm just reading the comments, sorry. Uh, 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 what's it called? Leaving a new build and um, potentially Ely, which is another place where Thomas Tresham, um, well, he built, leaved a new build. It never got finished. And he decorated his cell in the Bishop's Palace at Ely. Uh, cell, it was a room. Um, so uh, if I... Um, currently reading all about it ready to bring it to you uh amy never misses a history after dark good girl um <laughs> marie please note we are a tad potty mouthed on had we are a tad potty mouth that is uh yes that's a nice way to put it Renny. i agree a little potty mouth to the point i have to what i have to run out because of my kids <laughs> what is had forgive my ignorance ursula you are not ignorant uh I am, um, I will tell you all about it. So History After Dark is a unbridled look at uh, topics and hist uh, in history and uh, yeah, in unbridled in topics, unbridled in the way that we talk about them. You may well hear the odd or frequent cuss. Uh, it's history.after.dark on Instagram and it is um, just History After Dark on YouTube. Um <laughs> Elvis, uh, not the question I've been asked before. Uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, check out my interview with Tracy. I'll say I'll I'll share some links to all of this stuff. Um, join my Patreon if you haven't already. Why not? Oh, and you must must if you're interested in, um, well, especially James. Well, I've already spoken. Tracy Borman is doing a talk about um, James the First and the witch hunts, English witch hunts. These are ones that. Um, they're, they're less, much, much, much less well known, um, partly because I think the Tu the Stuart period itself is less, um, it gets much less attention because it comes straight after the Tudors and everyone's really um, understandably but drawn to the Tudors. And so this, so this weekend we're looking at the Stuarts at our online history festival, the Stuart Summit. We've got Tracy Borman talking, Gareth Russell. Uh, he's talking about Charles II, the politics of promiscuity. O'Leary Lynn talking about styling the Stuarts, how they used clothes to um, sort of put across messages and literally how they were dressed as well. Uh, we have Leanza Delisle talking about Henrietta Maria, um, incredible woman who um, um, she sort of got this black legend. She talks about the real woman behind the black legend. And Tony Akini talking about Sarah Churchill, who many of us are like, Ugh, she's so interesting. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, Bree says, yeah, when I think of which trials we think about um, as here in the US, looking forward to Tracy's talk. Yeah, it's it's really enlightening. Um, to Antonia, um, Kat, Dr. Kat, um, from Reading the Past on YouTube and um, a fellow collaborator on History After Dark is talking about uh, the uh, the use of imagery the propaganda through imagery, this idea of the divine right to rule and how that was um, many examples. She's used examples to show how that was put across. Uh, and Julian Humphreys talking about the real um, motivations uh, and aims behind the English civil wars um, might surprise you. They were not to topple the king and they certainly weren't to execute him. So um, that's, again, really eye opening. So Thank you all to those of you who've already bought your tickets. Um, if you haven't bought your tickets yet and you would like to, um, they're on sale until I think it's seven o'clock tomorrow night. Uh, the event starts at eight o'clock. Uh, this is all London time. And if you can't make it live for one or any of the talks, don't worry, because they're all available until the end of January. So you have plenty of time. I've already had a lady contact me who's in Australia. Um, which of course makes the times difficult, not for all the talks, but for some of them. So yes, they will be available um, for a long time because you might want to watch them again, of course. That's the other thing. You, you don't just have to watch them once, you can watch them again. Um, oh, and on the Sunday night, I would flash this up, but you might, you might stop the video and, and get an idea. I have the questions for the quiz. We've got a fun quiz on the Sunday night. That's our closing event. Bring a bottle, bring nibbles, 
join us on on that um, and play along and see whether you've uh, or what you've learned over the weekend, even if you haven't got a chance to to see the talks and you but you want to join the quiz live then do do that because you're going to learn something from the quiz and it's going to be fun and um, there's me and Catherine Brooks who's not just the Tudor tracker hosting that um thank you Jenna for um sharing the <laughs> for sharing the link again Colleen show us show us the questions no no questions and the answers are here it's exciting. So we've got uh, like four or five questions on each talk. So the quiz will be about an hour. Um, <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be fun. On the Saturday night, we have a live panel um, for Q and A's. So they're a panel of Stuart um, authors, and uh, and also Antonia Keeney, who's the the lady who um, she's actually a social his the social historian at. Blenheim Palace, which is why she knows so much about Sarah Churchill. She's going to be joining us and hopefully Dr. Cat will be joining us as well. She is on babysitting duty. She's flying solo with her little one. So um, so we can't bill her uh, as as appearing in case in case that doesn't happen. But we, we hold out hope um, and you'll be able to ask your questions. If you have a question of um, that you want to be put to the panel, because but you can't make it uh, live, then you can email it to office at britishhistorytours.com I'll pick that up and uh, and, and uh, put it to the panel on Saturday night Jenna's really looking forward to this weekend yeah it's going to be fantastic I, I love I just love um it's amazing how how we can get this sense of community um even though we're all over the world and it's online um yeah nothing beats being in person but I feel like we we're really close um on uh, to it um, online. Everyone, we have got to the hour mark. We are over the hour mark. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, yeah, Marie, C Catherine would be cross if we cheated since she's put all the questions together. <laughs> she's worked hard. She's worked really hard. Um, so thank you for joining me. I will be back tomorrow for visiting Tudor Britain. That's four o'clock on Instagram. Um, join me, Deb Royal from the Tudor uh, from Tudor Times and Tudor Places magazine, and um, Sarah Morris, who's um, the Tudor Travel Guide. Um, we will be all together tomorrow at four o'clock on my channel talking about Worcester. So join me for then and um, sign up to my Substack. If you just go to my bio on Instagram and follow the links, you'll find all the sorts of stuff that you were. Uh, uh, places that you might be interested, including sign up to my free Substack. So. Um, I wish you all a very good day. Um, thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Robin. Thank you to everyone who's bought me super chats on YouTube and badges on Instagram. It is always um, much appreciated. And also thank you to all those who've bought tickets for Stuart Summit and those who've joined my Patreon as well. Um, it helps. It helps me stay doing this. So thank you so much. Everyone, I will leave you to your day. I'm going to try and simultaneously stop streaming on both channels. It probably won't work. But anyway, thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.